What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Dr. V Podcast. I'm your host, Jessie Verga. Today, I have an amazing guest. You might know her from her social media page where she shares inspirational videos, workout videos, kind of aspects of her life, both the ups and the downs to kind of share what it's like to motivate yourself when you don't feel like motivating yourself and a level of resiliency that I truly look up to and that truly inspires me. And she just released her book. In these pages lies magic, heartbreak, and mayhem, the poetic woes of a woman. It is a collection of poems that she spent over a year writing while she was on deployment away from her kids, you know, serving this country and extremely powerful stuff. So today we're going to be talking to her not about her fitness journey, but what it's like being an immigrant to the United States, serving your country, proceeding on to law enforcement, being an actual service to others, and an active member of society and having three amazing children. So with that, let's get into the interview with Diana. Uh, let's see, from childhood. So originally I was born in Mexico. Um, I was born in Michoacan, which is like Southwest of Mexico. There's a little town called Lázaro Cárdenas, which is closer to the coast. Most of my family's from Apatzingan, but me and my brother were like the odd ones out and we were born there. Um, around like six, I want to say, like five or six, my mom decided to obviously come over to this country, not in the legal manner. Um, uh, she did the whole thing. She sent for us. We, I think we came over with my aunt um, and then we went to Texas first, where we were hosted by um, a lady there who takes in um, immigrants. Uh, she like gives them housing, she gives them food and stuff in exchange for some labor work. And then um, I, I don't know how long we were there. My memory is fuzzy on that. But then we ended up in Kansas. Uh, we started going to school there. My first word was apple. I got a duck. A, yellow duck that my mom still has for <laughs> saying my first English word. And then um, we lived in Kansas for a little bit, went to Missouri and that's, well, we were in like Kansas City, Kansas, and then there's Kansas City, Missouri. So then we went to Kansas City, Missouri, and that's where I grew up. Uh, went to school there, did elementary, middle, high school. Um, and then uh, my senior year of high school, well, let me backtrack. When I was like in elementary school, my mom, um, it was like late elementary. My mom got married again to my stepdad and uh, he petitioned for us to get our residency. Um, he was a citizen at the time. So it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I got my letter from immigration for my interview. And I had to go back to uh, Tijuana was it? Mm -hmm. Is it oh, Juarez? I had to go back. I had to go to Juarez for my interview right. where they mm -hmm. had the whatever immigration stuff. Um, went there, got rejected my first time. I thought I was going to like live in Mexico for the rest of my life after growing up in the United States. I was terrified. It was my senior year of high school. It was like the first month. So I missed the whole first month of my senior year of high school. Um, I was upset because I had a standing 4.0 GPA. I had a 4.5 GPA. And it brought me down to like a 340. I don't know why I remember that, but I was just really mad about it because, you know, that kind of like uh, screwed me over in school. Um, as an immigrant child, you know, like we're super overachievers. We want to be the best at everything. Um, so came back. Um, I decided that I wanted to enlist in the military because it was just the quickest way to get money. I had gotten my resin residency at that point because um, I went back for my second interview and they approved me to get my residency. Um, and I don't really know what spurred me on to like join the military, to be honest. I don't remember like the thought process that crossed in my mind. I know that I had spoken to a recruiter. Oh, I had spoken to a recruiter and he was telling me about um, the OCS process and everything and how I could do that. And then um, all I heard was like the money portion. So OCS would have required me to go to college and stuff. And um, I didn't know 
what I wanted to major in. Um, so I was like, screw it, I'm just gonna go enlisted, did that, did four years active duty, got out, went reserves. Um, when I got out, I was like very, uh, I don't know, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. So I started going to school for interior design. Um, and then I changed my mind. I didn't like interior design. I didn't like working with clients. And um, I started working for a nonprofit ministry, made amazing friends there that I'm still friends with. Um, I was a very devout Christian back then. Um, and it, I just felt like it was like my purpose to like work there. Like, uh, but then nonprofits, I don't know if you've ever worked for a nonprofit before, but nonprofits have a sort of shady way of doing things sometimes. Like pe people are gonna be human and they're gonna take advantage of that. So I was working under a guy who did just that, took advantage of his trips and everything and was working like his side business and every, he would expand his side business in every country that he got sent to on a work trip. I didn't like that. I was the one who was like doing his uh, trip vouchers and stuff. So I kind of caught on to the shady stuff he was doing. Then decided I didn't want to work there anymore. And that's when, when I went from active duty military to reserves, I went from being an aviation mechanic to a gunner's mate. So at that point I had already started doing like the tactical stuff. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to immerse myself in that world. I always hated law enforcement because I always grew up really scared of immigration. Um, was always scared of guns because my mom was just like terrified and she like instilled that fear in me. And so I was like, let me immerse myself in something. Since I'm already here, I've already gotten the opportunity to experience uh, getting my residency. I got my citizenship while I was active duty. So I got naturalized. The ceremony was beautiful. And then I'm like, why am I going to waste this opportunity to do things that I've never done before in my life? And, you know, and live a life that is going to enable like keep enabling my fears so at that point i'm like okay i'm gonna immerse myself in the world of law enforcement um and i started working for the homeland of the, or the department of homeland security um it was very anticlimactic i thought it was gonna be more exciting <laughs> um but it wasn't and then uh while i was working one day a um a recruiter. Oh, is that your dog? Yeah, he only barks when I'm on the phone or like doing one of these podcasts. Oh, he's a, <laughs> um, a recruiter came up to me for uh, the police department that I work with now, and he was like, "You should really consider it." Took his card, forgot about it, and then I tried to go Secret Service. Um, that process was long. It was way too long. Uh, it was like so much paperwork. I got my second interview approved. Then I got a call back the next day telling me that I was not approved to go on to the next phase. And then I was like, okay, well, I need a job. And then I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, at that point, COVID was still going on. Um, and I was like, I had a lot of time to like sit at home and just think about what I wanted to do in the next step of my life. So I was like, okay, well, if the federal stuff isn't going to work out for me, then let me just, let me go local. And then that's when I was like, all right. So I applied to different departments in my area. Um, and then I kind of just went with one that was like the quickest process. Um, but it ended up being really good. It's one of the best departments here, like in the southeast part of Virginia, um, and I'm and now I'm here, and I'm really grateful for it. There's a lot to my story besides my professional career, but that is like going down a deep, deep rabbit hole. <laughs> At what point um, throughout your career, like, did you have your kids in the Navy, like, while you were active duty? How did I know that they're like various ages? So, yeah. So my oldest is nine. He. I had him a year after I had, uh, or a couple of years after I started active duty. Um, and I had him after my initial pregnancy that I had stillbirth with. Um, so 
coming back to work from having him was hard because people, you know, they shit talk and they're like, oh, you just want to get out of deployment, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I had my daughter. She was a surprise. I didn't know I was pregnant with her. Um, I had her. They're called Irish twins, I guess. They're born so, in the same year. Uh, is that what it is? Or within yeah. like 12 months or whatever? Oh, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's within 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what they are. She's. Yeah. So he's going to be nine. She's going to be eight. He's going to be nine in October. She's going to be eight in November. Um, oh, wow. So... They're like right on the cusp of Irish twins. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't know what that stuff is, but I had them pretty close together and then I didn't have my youngest. He's four. Um, I had him during COVID. He's a COVID baby. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, I had my daughter the year before I got out of active duty and then I had my son a couple of years in and then my, my youngest, I had him 2020, which was like three years after I had gotten out and went into the reserves. Yeah. There, there's a little to unpack there. So I guess kind of like backing up to the beginning of your story, um, I obviously work in a position that um, kind of works with immigrants. How did you find the process back then? Like, I know that you guys came here in like the non-traditional route. Well, I shouldn't say non-traditional. The the You came here through a different route. Right. Um, how, when you did finally apply for residency or your, your stepdad did, it seems like there was a long gap between the application and actually getting an interview. Yeah, so, um, well, you work with uh, customs and everything. Each country yeah. has a different wait period. Um, mm -hmm. So I think Mexico is one of the countries where it's like a 10-year wait period or something like that, or like an extended wait period where it just takes longer for your application to get processed. Um, I'm not, that's as far as I know about the immigra immigration process. Should I know more? Yes. Um you were a kid. I just, no, just not holding it to it. I mean, yeah, I was a kid. I didn't. I didn't even know like my mom had done that. I didn't even know I was illegal until. I mean, I was in elementary school. I didn't find out until. I was in high school because people started talking about college and everything, and then. Um, when people were doing like college applications, they asked you for like a social security number and I asked my mom, I was like, Hey, do I have one? And she's like, uh, well, see, this is, you know, <laughs> what happened was type yeah. thing. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> okay. So that's a no for me, dog. Cool. Got it. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I think now I do pay attention heavily to immigration policy. I actually wrote my dissertation on immigration policy and how it's really? so messed up. Yeah. I, I do not like our immigration policy. The way it's set up right now is a business exchange. And I think that there are so many people that are waiting to come here that can really provide and really promote the culture of America that we're keeping on the sidelines or almost forcing here, forcing to come here illegally. So I don't. Like, just, I do agree with that. Yeah, like I, um, every week I go to a naturalization ceremony. I think they're absolutely amazing. Cause like I go to the one in LA. I, people are like, oh my God, I waited so long for this. Like there was yeah. so many Filipinos at mine that were waiting years. Yeah. Years. I'm not a crier, but like that, make, that shit makes me tear up every single time. Cause then mind you, I'm in downtown LA. So I watch this, I watch this ceremony and I immediately make a bout face and there's just a bunch of unproductive natural citizens already here. And I'm like, these people busted their ass to be here, paid thousands of dollars. And they're going to take that piece of paper and go do something amazing now. Whereas you got that shit at birth and you're not doing anything with it. Like, yeah. sorry, that's like my little tangent on that. Cause I, I, I mean, it, it goes both ways. There are a lot of people who are trying to get here for nefarious activities or to run from their sure. government, but that's the same for American citizens. When people mess up here, they run to Mexico or they run to like a non-extradition country. So it's like, you know, can't really point fingers. Yeah. But, um, I think the thing that trips me out the most as a law enforcement officer is when people like are racist towards me and they're just like, go back to your country. And these are homeless individuals who are doing nothing with their life. And like yeah. I got called a Native American 
Um, yeah, it's always the I hard R this, every time. <laughs> when I took this, uh, and I, I'm sorry that I had, I mean, that's how he said it. I'll right? believe it. I don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Verbatim. Um, yeah. But, and I'm just like, my God, you're, you're in jail. I, I'm literally booking yeah. you right now. You're yeah. to go back to my country and you're calling me racist things. Um, like, it just doesn't make sense to me. And then I see, yeah. I see, you know, I encounter my people. There's every city has their specific area where there's like a his, big Hispanic population. They all live in the same area, right? And um, they're so scared to call the cops. Yeah, they're so I... scared. They're terrified. I was walking to court literally yesterday, and there was a Hispanic construction worker, and I was like, "Buenos dias," and he's like, "Wow, one of you actually speaks Spanish," and I'm like, "The representation <laughs> is low, my guy. Oh my god." Yeah insane it breaks my heart that people have to feel like feel like they need to live in a state of fear because of the worst case scenario but i think that fear comes from a real place because of what they've seen it's just kind of like learning from other people and it's unfortunate that they that they're that way now i'm brown i'm not hispanic so sometimes when i go to work people are like call me a traitor and i'm like we are not from (laughs) we are not cut from the same cloth (laughs) but (laughs) i am not a traitor (laughs) trying to help you out um yeah so yeah. there's a there's that interesting dynamic i think of being a minority in in law enforcement you mentioned nonprofits, which i thought was extremely interesting so i have my own nonprofit, and we have an entire department dedicated to investigating other nonprofits. so i perform i conduct investigations into like especially really? animal rescues because they're it's i honestly like like audit them and stuff so it, even even deeper than that so uh, it's interesting that you say that because I think more people are starting to realize the abuse of power that nonprofits have. Maybe not, I'm not, I'm not familiar with like the religious context, but I've worked with other nonprofits, especially ones that are supposed to be providing aid to homeless mm-hmm. and just diversions of funds and people working there with extensive criminal histories. And I kind of go in there and conduct an inter- um uh, I can't say interrogation. It's like not the politically correct term. It's like interview. <laughs> um, yeah. So I conduct an interview and look into that. Um, a lot of it's open source. A lot of it's talking to people. Um, and then I take all of that information and I petition the district attorney or the county clerk, depending on the municipal um, organization, yeah. and uh, basically tell them to do something about it. Then I also make that information public because they're a nonprofit. That information is supposed to be public. Correct. So I publish that shit online, yeah. like on our website. I say, here, this is the result of our investigation. I even investigated Dawn Oliveri, who is um, one the leading actress in Yellowstone. Really, I had to I had to investigate her nonprofit because there were a ton of allegations of misuse of funds and uh, animal abuse. Wow. She rescues horses. All of the allegations ended up not being true. Everything was like, like everything was like legit. She actually funded most of it herself. But anyway. Um, so kind of like moving on from that. Sorry, I'm pretty sure I could talk to you about that shit all day. Um, so so you went, I mean, I, I think as females in law enforcement, I think we have a different take sometimes on the different nuances of the way things work. But you're the first person I've ever talked to that's kind of been on both sides of the house that was federal and then um, and then kind of went public. I've talked to tons of people that, went, that were public and then went federal. So I think their outlook's different. I met you through social media Mm-hmm. Um, through like a variety of friends, but the Navy's small sometimes, yeah. especially on the East Coast. Um, okay. How do you manage all of that? Because you're a mom, you're law enforcement, you're a reservist, like, and then you do your fitness stuff, you maintain your personal health. How do you, how do you find that? Yeah, I'm not a reservist anymore, by the way. I, oh, my nice. contract ended in July. Um, and to answer that part of the question is I had to, I have to be very careful with what I put on my plate. I used to put a lot on my plate and be like, I'm going to figure it out as I go. But as my kids get older and as they require um, just a lot of time with me, like they're more cognizant of me being away from them. Um, Also, like going through my divorce and everything, you know, that like affects them even more. So I I need to provide them more attention, um, more love, more care to help them like just navigate this big, big change in their life. Um, So I decided to get out of the reserves 
Well, I didn't just, I was going to re-enlist, but some paperwork got messed up. And then, you know, I ended up just, my EOS came up and I was like, you know what, this is probably actually for the best. Um, Because now I don't have one foot in one career and one foot in another. And I felt so stressed. And now that I'm out, I feel like there's a big weight or a significant weight lifted off my shoulders because I don't have to worry about drills and getting sitters for my kids. I don't have to worry about putting in orders with my, or giving my job my orders and taking days off and figuring my life out before I leave and this and that. And then not seeing my kids when I'm gone like two, three weeks at a time. Um, So I had to, I had to really think about what is a priority to me? Like, first of all, what what's my purpose in life what's my passion and what are what are the wickets that fall under the purpose in my life like what am i going to um pour into what are the categories that i'm going to pour into to fulfill that purpose and am i passionate about these things right and so me combining my purpose and my passion is super important right i think to me if i'm very passionate about my purpose then when the motivation is gone my passion and then like my discipline that i've learned to build over the years takes over Um, when i'm having a bad day i'm just like i am having a bad day but my passion burns greater than than my bad day and so i can continue to do what i need to do so I had to decide that the Navy wasn't something that was, it was a very like sporadic medium in which I fulfilled my purpose because I wasn't there consistently. It was, you know, it's very part-time when you're in the reserves. I loved my sailors. I loved my job. I loved working with my people. However, it wasn't, I wasn't consistently around them to I guess like I can make a temporary impact, but to me, it's like, what am I going to consistently be doing with, for these people, with these people, like building a community? Um, they're always going to be my brothers and sisters, but we're so far away that it makes it hard to have cohesiveness. And that's also really important to me. So I was like, what are the things that I'm going to pour into that are cohesive, that I can be consistent in? And that is going to pour back into me as well, right? Because I'm not just doing this because I'm, oh my gosh, so selfless or whatever. Like I am a human and I also need to pay my bills and I need to take care of my children and I need to, right, like pour into my cup, right? Because if I'm just pouring into other people's cups, it's kind of, it's it's mute to even like do it. Um, so yeah, I just, I had to decide that my kids were important. Um, Myself, I'm I'm important. I I want to be able to be here, to be around the people that I love and the people that love me, so that I can build a community of support. Um, I've never gone through any hardship in life and made it through by myself, ever. Um, and going through my divorce made me realize that I have been gone for so long, and I only had really consistently like two people that I could rely on emotionally and then everybody else was like they were like very sporadic interactions with them where you know I cared about them they cared for me but I didn't have a community so my point is I I just decided that I wanted to be here i wanted to be present the ministry of presence is super important to me so i was like okay my kids matter to me being present around the people that i love so that we can pour into each other matters to me my job matters to me my love life matters to me um and so i now i navigate my life in a way in which you know i'm able to pour into my children pour into my job it's never going to be a good balance you know sometimes you're pouring more into one than the other but um but I also wanted to pour into myself and and like be able to be around 
just around my community um, to really make an impact. It's like I can make a an impact through social media, but I'm not on social media all the time, right? But I am if I choose to be around people that I can impact with, you know, being there for them, doing things for them, being there for my children to listen to their problems and kiss their boo-boos and stuff and make them delicious dinner and cookies and desserts. And um, when I really thought about it, I'm like, if I were if I were to die, if I knew that I was going to die tomorrow, I wouldn't choose to deploy. I wouldn't choose to go out of town for business to progress my career, do something for something else. I would choose to do things for me, things that fulfill me. And so I'm like, and so if I knew that I was going to die tomorrow, like, why am I not doing that now? So I had a shift. Um, I used to be very active on social media, but I've slowed down a lot because my mindset shifted to more important things. No, agreed. How do you find now in terms of like, cause you mentioned a support system now that you've aligned, it sounds like you've aligned your, your passion and your purpose do you find that that's reinforced your support system or introduced new people into your support system or or how does that dynamic kind of worked? Hey guys, I wanted to interrupt this video real quick and remind you that my free guide, Wellness, Wisdom, and Warfare, A Veteran's Guide for Mastering Life is now available for download using the link in the description or if you go to my website, jessieverga.com slash free guide or it's under the podcast tab, you can download it for absolutely free. It's over 60 pages of just tips and tricks and things to help my veterans out there master their health, master their fitness, master their mental and spiritual health, just things that I've learned through my journey as just a veteran and that I've learned as an educator and as a professional in multiple fields, as an entrepreneur. I put all these things in one place and I have put it together for absolutely free. So again, Link is in the description, or if you head to my website, jessieverga.com, you can download it for absolutely free. Yeah, so it has reinforced my support system, and it's also introduced more people. When I came back from deployment, um, and I obviously started getting acclimated with my job again, uh, I met one of my best friends. I met her there. I met her at the gun range doing my calls to come back to get on the street again. Um, and so now, you know, I had those interactions. We, uh, had, um, English is hard right now. Words are very hard. Um, it's late as <laughs> shit by you see. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we had a, a shared, uh, love of just shooting and guns and everything and like tactical mm -hmm. high speed stuff. Um, her name is Kristen. Obviously she also works with me. She's amazing. I post her all the time. Um, and so she was another person that got added into my little bundle of like community. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think having a big circle is not really like a big deal to me, but I think having different people that can pour into your life in different ways is super important. And so my community has been, it's been reinforced and added to and the most possible I was waiting for my dog to pass, but he's just barking. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's it's an interesting statement. Say again? I said he wants to share a statement. <laughs> I, he is quiet all day. I had to get on a meeting earlier, and the second I hit on mute, it was like he knows. I'm like, all right, just <laughs> this way it's going to have to be. But that is um, yeah, he's, he's awesome. Uh, but I think that's interesting because I, I find that when I meet other women, especially at like the range or women with similar interests, um, especially as it relates to like law enforcement or like your ideologies kind of line up, mm -hmm. I really think that it's just so rare. It's like somewhere in the universe, someone was like, these two people need to meet at some point, you know, depending on whatever your faith is. But yeah. um, sometimes I'm just like, what are the chances that I was going to meet you here of all places? So that's, um, I, I met a really good friend also at the range. Um, it was, a we were not calling. We were just at like a regular gun range. Um, he needed ammo. He's like, can you please? Like, he's like, I just like, I got one more, one more round in me. And I was like, oh yeah, I got you, bro. And, uh, 
and him and I became really good friends. So I, yeah, I, I can definitely relate. I think the range is a great place to meet people. Uh, oh my they're... God, yes. <laughs> Better than a bar. Like... <laughs> it is because it's like, I think a range is, it's such a vulnerable place. If you want to, mm -hmm. if you want to get really vulnerable with somebody, I think you should go shoot together yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you're, you're either going to like, I don't know. You just always show right where, your strong suits, your weak points, um, and you get to see those in them too. And then you get to familiarize yourself with like new concepts. It's like learning things together and trying to figure out how to get better at something, which is shooting, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you're both admitting that there's, there's space to learn and you're giving each other like a safe space to navigate that. And I, I love the range for that reason, honestly. Yeah. No, that's that's definitely true. I mean, I'm sure that can be said for a lot of things. And I'm thinking, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story after all this, but there's a, a funny uh, story about the range. Um, I guess, so kind of shifting over a little bit, you mentioned, um, I, I like the, the metaphor essentially of like not pouring all of yourself into something that's not going to give back to you. And that kind of like system of um, compatibility and that comprehensive like cohesiveness I know that you have recently started on a little bit of like a business venture. You have like a poetry page and I think there was a book if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So I think, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I just, I don't know you. I know, I don't know you very well, I guess I could say. I know yeah. you from social media. So I, I thought that was really impressive because whenever someone shows essentially a vulnerability and a creative side, I'm like, wow, like there's so many facets to you. So can you talk a little bit about that and that, like, where that poetry came from? Yeah. Uh, so, damn. I started writing poetry. I've always written poetry, but I really, really started getting into it when um, my ex and I first started, like, decided to separate. It was just, like, a really healthy outlet for me. Um, I... I've talked about it before on my lives. Like I resorted to drinking heavily, not in a way where it like endangered myself or endangered anybody, but on like when I was on my own, even, or when I would go out, like I would just, I would overdo it. Like, would I be safe? Yes. But that's not the point. The point was that like, I, I overdid it, you know, like, you know, when you, when you drink too much, cause you're trying to escape, you're not like, tr you're not doing it to socialize. And mm -hmm. so I got to that point And then I realized that I didn't want to be that person. Like I looked at myself in the mirror one day and I was like, man, I, I don't like who I'm looking at. Like she's, she's different. Yes. I, I'm more fit. Uh, I was skinnier. I, I felt better about my physical sense, but like my inner world was a mess. Um, and I needed, I needed something to put my mess into instead of like trying to get rid of it, trying to numb it in my head. I just, I needed to put it down on paper and I was like the best outlet that I had. Um, I started writing, I started writing about how I felt. Um, I think in my marriage, if I was just to give a little bit more, um, my ex is just very emotionally disconnected and I learned to be that way too, so that I wouldn't, um, just to appease him and so that I wouldn't like make him mad if I was ever emotional about something. I became a very logical person. I suppressed my emotions so much that I didn't know how to express them anymore. So writing helped me it helped me just like think about how I really felt um, and process like all of my experiences. The biggest thing that I started writing about that I never fully processed was the stillbirth of my daughter. Um, that was just something that I always carried with me and I, I never knew, I never knew how to grieve. Like I cried because I was sad obviously, but I didn't know how to process my grief. Um, and so I started writing poetry to, to help me do that. And then eventually um, that helped me. I realized that that helped me get to like a better mental space about what happened. And 
And then I was like, man, like, this is this is therapy in a sense, you know? So I just, from then, whenever the separation came along, um, I just started writing poetry about how I felt, um, different situations that I never processed. Uh, and I just, I didn't want to resort back to bad habits. Um, and then I decided, somebody told me, I shared my poetry with, with somebody um, in person and they're like, you should really write a book. And I was like, I don't know about it. I, I'm not like, I'm not like a book writer. Um, I've been told I should write a book about like my life story because it's very crazy. There's a lot of like different crazy parts about my life that people didn't think that I'd gone through, I guess. Cause I'm like a very like chipper, like, oh my God, love everybody kind of person. Like, I think they think I'm naive in a sense, but I'm, I'm not, I think I'm just smart enough to realize that life is like really not that deep because I've, I've been in the deep. <laughs> it's really not that deep. You know? <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, uh, I then decided on, I had this journal that I bought. <laughs> um, my ex and I actually went to Barnes and Noble and I was like, Oh, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to start writing my poetry and I'm going to make a book. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, I was like, okay. And so I, I think I just took it and I took it with me on deployment. And um, I decided, I don't know if you saw that post, but last year I was like, by this time next year, I'm going to have a book released. And so mm -hmm. I dedicated a lot of time on deployment, just writing, just writing about now that I was able to take myself physically away from my situation. Um, I was able to have the space to process because I wasn't in the midst of like what was causing my emotional, uh, what's that word? Turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to just have that space and I just wrote, I wrote every time I, I started crying. I was like, what am I really feeling? Like, why am I feeling like this? Like, and then I just wrote and like, I would like sometimes just sit there like super sad and like, like verses would just come into my head and I'm like, oh my God, this is like such a great poem. And I just, I wrote it down and I'm like, it doesn't matter like how silly it sounds, how silly, I don't know, the words seem or my emotions seem on paper. Like this is, I'm going to choose to be vulnerable enough to put this out to the world because I've talked to so many ladies who have gone through the same thing and they just, they don't talk about it. Like divorce is such a shameful subject, right? And um, and I think like as as moms, we feel so much guilt to even try to process it. We're just like, we're strong and we can't show our kids our weakness. You know, like that's like the minority mindset. It's like, mm -hmm. um, but I was like, I'm, I'm actually not strong. I'm not, but I'm capable. And that's what I want to show my children. That's what I want to showcase through my poetry and and that's how I decided that I was going to to follow through um and it, it wasn't even meant for anybody at all it was like meant for me like that I'm capable enough to be vulnerable because I had such a I had been so emotionally closed off for so long that I was like if I can do this then you know I I can be vulnerable in like the everyday things um so it's more of a challenge to myself yeah, I think that level of resiliency, I think that in itself is such a powerful lesson. I was essentially raised by a single mom. My mom and I are best friends. I didn't really have a close relationship with my father. Even though he was in my life, we were not very close. Um, and my mom's resiliency and her ability to kind of like start from nothing and continue to be that like warrior for me was like the greatest impact um, yeah. as especially as the oldest um, to see that. Oh, you're the I, oldest. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know how that worked out. <laughs> um, I'm great. a giant child. But um, it's funny. So I'm going to show you something real quick. So I journal all of the time. I don't write poetry. I'm not creative in that space. But I have found that journaling is like the best outlet for me. So I have like all of these journals, dusty as hell, and like these We're little notebooks. 
Yeah. So they each have like their own theme. So really? uh, yeah, and I'll I'll share share some with you. So there's this book right here. This is totally just this is like my podcast space, but yeah. it's also the quietest room in my house. So I come in here to journal. Um, so this is called The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten. And it's a hundred kind of like philosophical questions because I found that now I'm, I'm not a parent, but coming from especially coming from like immigrants, like my family immigrated here from South America. Okay. Uh, you're kind of taught to be, you know, I, I think it's a cultural thing. Like you're taught to be strong. You're taught not to be vulnerable. You kind of just got to keep on chugging forward. And uh, I found it very difficult for me to be vulnerable, even alone, like yeah. to allow yourself to grieve and allow yourself to feel what you feel. Uh, yeah. So I got this book and it's, um, it's just a bunch of philosophical questions. Like even something as simple as like, is there such thing as free will? And so I have a journal where I ask myself and I talk about these like philosophical questions. And then, you know, I have like, like this journal that was loud. Sorry. Um, this is kind of like a daily journal where I probably shouldn't show this on screen, but, uh, <laughs> but like, oh, anyway, yeah, that's whatever. But this is kind of more like what's happening day to day and like how an experience made me feel. Yeah. Cause that's a foreign concept, I think to communities, but like, yeah, I, um, it's, I have books here too. Like, I just started reading the Bible. I didn't grow up Catholic or girl. My dad's side is Roman Catholic. I didn't grow up that way. So like, I'm like finally reading the Bible. Um, that, say again. How's that going? You know, um, I actually have a book in here that's specifically for, um, oh yeah, it's this one right here. Like I take like my favorite quotes out of the Bible and I put them in this book. Um, I think it's interesting so my mom is Hindu and my dad is Roman Catholic. Okay. So crazy differences. Did you get along? Uh no. <laughs> no. <laughs> they were like never even together. I've only ever known my parents separated. But um in terms of philosophy, it's entirely different. So um and I, I work with a lot of Christian business owners and they talk to me sometimes and like, sometimes they want to pray together before a business meeting. And I'm like, all right. Like, yeah. I think I'm a faithful person, but the Bible has been interesting because I'm going into this kind of never having really had any guidance. So I, I tried going to some churches, but I find that all these mega churches real, they really give off like culty vibes. Oh, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you got a guitar in this place? Like, this is weird. I'm telling um, you, man, I came from such a very, uh, I wouldn't say conservative, um, but I was in the church from, man, ever since I can remember. And then I didn't get out until, shoot, I want to say like, short after my son was, well, during COVID, actually. I wow. went yeah. a little bit after, and then after that, I was like, you know what? I think COVID kind of just that time away made me realize that I don't, I didn't need. The community was amazing. The people were amazing, but I think you know a lot of people have like herd mentality. Yeah. Um, and it it's like that when you bring a bunch of people who are just very needy together, um, they tend to. You know, we want to feel validated and stuff like that, which is okay. It's a very human thing to do. But then in your – in seeking validation, you – I think as a as a congregation, you invalidate things that are outside of, like, the norm of religion. And it yeah. kind of makes people feel – you know, people who are not like them feel, like, very outsiders – and I don't think that they do it intentionally. I just think that they do it subconsciously because, you know, we want to feel like we're, we're a part of something. Yeah, that's – so when I approached this, a friend of mine, he's actually the one who kind of inspired me to do this, a really good friend of mine. He, um, he listens to the podcast, so I won't name him by name. But he, uh, he joined a church, one of those mega churches, and it became his entire personality. And I'm like, dude, like – take a step back. Like you're a Marine, you're infantry, like do these things make sense? And 
it it's every single piece of him now to the point where he's unrecognizable and i i find that he doesn't think for himself anymore Mm -hmm. so when i approach this kind of like religious study i have multiple holy books here i have the quran here like i'm not i'm not trying to learn just about one um i'll just pull this out real quick so i bought so i had my neighbor give me this like 30 days in god's word it's supposed to be like a cliff notes version of the bible and then i bought this study bible (laughs) and this has historical context because i think that's a little bit easier for me being yeah. somewhat of like a logical person, person needing to like rationalize things. Mm-hmm. It kind of aligns biblical texts to actual historical evidence. Um, so you can kind of delineate between what may have been more of a story and what could have possibly actually happened. So um, yeah, anyway, but the journaling thing I think is so important. I, um, I, saw, some of you, I saw some of your posts where you shared some of your poetry and I was like, shit, this is good. <laughs> like, um, I read all the time, but like, I, I think that that creative side of you, again, I don't know you like that. So for me, it was, I'm learning a little bit more about you. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So, um, you know, I'll have to leave a link for that. Is that still for sale? Your book? It is. It's on Amazon. I have an Amazon list for this podcast. So I'll make sure that I add it to the list. Thank um, you. Yeah. You know, I, I got you, I got you. Um, no, it's really good. I've actually been meaning to buy a copy. I wanted to make sure I read it before this podcast, but I wasn't really too sure when we were going to sit down. So I'm I'm going to buy a copy myself. And then I'm going to start doing like a book review. I have a, a spinoff podcast called Path to Faith, where I talk about like my spiritual journey, but not as it relates to any specific like religion, yeah. mostly because I think, um, I think for me as a veteran, I lost a lot of like that spiritual wellness while in the military because military has a way of ripping the mask off of what you think is real kind of showing you the reality of the world and you're like is there a god if this is happening so that's kind of like where i've been at but kind of moving past that sorry Uh, so um i I guess my question is because i know you as dan on social media (laughs) uh how has your like fitness journey progressed? Cause it sounds like you've done a lot of like personal growth. So I'm curious as to how that's impacted your like physical health and your fitness journey. Hey, did you guys know that at the end of this video, there is a riddle and there has been a riddle at the end of every single one of my videos every single week. Now in the past, I would leave you guys the answers. I have decided to remove the answers from being at the end screen. And now the first person to correctly answer the riddle in the comments below, I will pin that comment. And maybe one day when this channel grows and I get some sponsors, I'll be able to give you guys some free stuff for guessing the riddle correctly. But with that, let's get back into the video. Yeah. Uh, My fitness journey is a direct correlation of my mental health. Um, If you go back to the beginning of when I started working out, I was very small. I was a cardio bunny and I killed myself and deprived myself of food. And that was when my world started crashing down with my marriage just not going well. Um, And I did it more out of like spite for my ex. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I I am like the best thing. That's the best looking thing that you're going to be with or whatever. Right. So I lost a lot of weight and not in a good way. Um, but I'm grateful for that because it did kickstart the journey that has led me to where I am now. Um, and then obviously I went through my pregnancy, uh, my pregnancy with my son, my, my last baby, my youngest, it was the best, honestly, the best pregnancy that I had ever had. I had a strong after I had immersed myself in the gym community, um, this was a couple of years after my very, like, I would say, I wouldn't say I was anorexic. I just had a very bad uh, relationship with food and myself. Um, but at, after that, a couple of years after that, when I got pregnant with my son, I had built a great community within the gym and I had people along that were like training alongside me that taught me how to eat properly, how to train properly. 
And so my pregnancy went really, really well. I worked out literally up until the day that I gave labor. And uh, after that, my recovery was that much better. Um, my world was still kind of going in shambles. It was slowly crumbling away, but I, fitness kept me afloat, honestly. And then the people that I met through fitness, I, I would, I am forever grateful for them. Like all the ladies that I am still friends with that my kids call auntie. Um, they, they literally, I don't know what, what I would do without them. I don't know that I'd be here. Um, honestly, like alive. Um, and so after that, after I went through like that very terrible, like mental stage, I was, I was still working out obviously, but, um, Mentally, I was not well, but because I had that outside support, I was able to kind of just continue. Um, I had built the discipline for it already, and it gave me something to look forward to every day. Um, and then I, I don't know, I think I, through working out through, through the gym, through my community, I built this resiliency that made me realize that like life is worth living. Um, being able to have the body that I have, uh, the health and everything like is something that I am very deeply grateful for. And then when I started realizing that I am grateful for what I can do physically, I literally mentally started practicing gratefulness. And I, at that point I was going through, I was going through the academy I started the academy um, seven months after I gave birth to my son. So I wasn't even fully recovered yet from my birth. Oh, shit. Um, yeah. But uh, I discovered David Meltzer's podcast. I don't know if you've ever heard his podcast. They're super short to the point, but a lot of what it touches on is gratefulness and, you know, living your purpose, living in your passion and things like that. And, um, and so once I started practice, practicing gratefulness, my, my mental health, I kid you the fuck not, it, it flipped. I, it, it like, it just flipped a switch in my head and I'm like, there's literally nothing. There's, there's nothing that, that can break me, right? Because it's, it's all a lesson it's all, it's a redirection, right? So I started thinking differently. Once I started practicing gratefulness, I started thinking differently about my problems. Um, and I started looking at them as lessons. And yes, there were still things that I had to navigate through, but they weren't things that were detrimental at that point for me. Um, and that helped me get through the academy, like physically and mentally. And then after that, it was just kind of like, I was just in a flow and I've been in a flow ever since. Um, and it's been amazing. It's been amazing to just kind of see like my mental health journey and like when that switch flipped, how I've been able to just grow from that. Um, and now I'm here and I'm, I think I'm in, I decided that I wasn't going to compete until I was in a mentally good place to love myself through the process through every single stage um to love the suck and to be able to have the mental emotional and physical resiliency to also pour into all the different areas of my life while going putting myself willingly through something really hard um so now i'm here getting ready for my first competition um after allowing myself to build that mental resiliency what um what category are you, are you going to be competing in i it's my first show so i'll be doing um amateur npc wellness oh wellness yeah that's that's good i mean yes you'll have you'll be in like the novice categories and i think novice. you can be novice for like the first two or three shows yeah there's a so between you i have another friend uh she's not a veteran her name is lulu uh she is a nurse up in Washington, but she's a mom, single mom, mm -hmm. and she competes. And for my clients that I train, this is a, whenever I have to motivate my clients and they give me excuses and they're like, I can't do it. And I'm just like, 
I'm going to send you two profiles. So I'm going to send you Lulu and I'm going to send you Diana. And you're going to oh see that. Like, <laughs> and I do. A lot of the, a lot of my clients, I've sent them your profiles because I'm just like, we can all make excuses, but here are two people who don't have kids. Like, or here's two people that have kids. You don't have kids and they're getting it done. So sometimes I think my clients need to see, it's hard for them to relate to me. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, like I have all the time in the world to go to the gym yeah. and to work out and like do everything else. But for them, they they see us kind of like on level in terms of time. They're like, well, you take days off. And I'm like, I do, but I'm I'm reaching my goals in my own way. But a lot of times people make a ton of excuses. And I'm like, if you have a mother of three who's preparing for a competition on top of being law enforcement, not that you should compare yourself to anybody else, but I think that there is a level of dedication and passion that needs to be reached. And it is possible. And here are two people that are making it possible. So I, I think that's kind of why I originally followed you. Cause anytime I feel like a lazy piece of shit, I'm like, bro, there are people who work all day and go home to kids and then go to the gym. And I'm like, I go to work all day and I come home to nobody. Like I have no fucking excuse. So I, I think it's important. At least for me, I try to surround myself with, even on social media with people who I look up to in a sense, because if I just packed my social media with like celebrity drama I wouldn't get anything done. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I think for me, it's um, the reason why I I have discipline, yes, but also the you have to have people in your life that keep you accountable in the areas that you want to be better in, right? You can't, mm -hmm. you can't be around people who keep you, enable you to be in like that complacent mind space. So yeah. I, have, I have somebody that challenges me at work um, I have a couple, I have a lot of people that challenge me at work, actually. My boyfriend being one of them, he's like one of the, gosh, he's a, he's a really great law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. Um, my best friend, she's, she's a go-getter. She's proactive. She's like high speed as fuck. And so is Kristen. So Brandy and Kristen are amazing. Michael's great. Um, and within the gym area, obviously for competing, I have to have a coach, right? But, um, he he's literally like the most caring and genuine person but he's also so knowledgeable but he takes the time out to like call me and be like hey how are you doing like how's your mental how's your week going where what areas are you stressed in and da, 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 and like how can i help you you know stay on track and be accountable and stuff like that like and within the gym obviously you're always going to be around people that have a physique that's better than yours or do things that, that are stronger or just like way more knowledgeable. Um, you actually, whenever um, you sent me your book before I released my book. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you sent me, you were telling me last year that you're working on a book and you actually really inspired me to follow through with my book. And I don't think that I ever told you this. But no, hell yeah, though. That's good. <laughs> talking to me last year about writing your book, I was like, here's a woman who also does similar things to me, who is super smart. She immerses herself in different things in life, right? Like you do jiu-jitsu you train people you're fucking you're writing a book you're in law enforcement you have clients like insane right yes you don't have kids but you still find a way to pour into other people and then do something that you're passionate about and i was like i can do that too right like and i i can be i'm capable just like she is that to be able to do those things and i think that's super important and it's what you do for your clients right like it's not comparing yourself to other people it's seeing the it's seeing that you are capable like this person is capable and we we all have the capability to follow through on things that are hard but that are so worth it but yeah, yeah i think literally. opening that opening that possibility i think is extremely important i'm glad you wrote your book because i think I kind of, I have like these mantras. That's what I call them. Like, so one of my mantras is to be a service to others. And 
that's kind of what I try to do in my publications. And, and that's what I saw in your book. So I, and, I, and even with your social media, I think that um, there are some misconceptions sometimes about people who post workout videos on social media. And I'm just like, it's so powerful for others. So I see sometimes like even on my own post, like the negative comments. And I'm just like, you are getting in the way of someone else's journey. Like keep that shit to yourself. It drives me nuts. But because of that, because of the fact that like there is in some remote way the ability to inspire somebody to do something that they've been putting on the back burner. So absolutely. So th yeah, I appreciate you saying that, that I'm, I'm glad that it it served more than one purpose. But um, yeah, the other thing I had a question about was um, a little bit about females in law enforcement. I have a little bit of a different perspective, I think, on this in terms of I think we should have more women in law enforcement, but also for the women that are already in law, law enforcement, that they, I feel like sometimes there's a little bit of a burden that we carry about, you know, the things that we're facing, the things that we're doing and constantly being in competition and bringing kind of a, a little bit of a different insight to the world of law enforcement. So how have you found, I know you work for a great department and it seems like you're surrounding yourself with other like amazing women in law enforcement. How have you found that dynamic of being a female in law enforcement? Um, there's obviously, when you're a female in law enforcement, if you're anybody in law enforcement, it's, I think it's like being a bodybuilder and putting yourself on stage, but you're putting yourself on a stage with the world that you're in, that you're working in. And you, I think you have to realize it's the reality that you're going to be judged by how you look. Um, that's the first, when you're walking up to a call, people aren't going to ask you for your name. They're going to, they're not going to ask you where you're from, right? They're going to see you as a female in uniform and they're immediately going to make a judgment, right? They're, they're immediately going to have some sort of opinion about you. Um, and I had to come to terms with that, but not to be conceited. I just know that I look the way that I look and people mm -hmm. have always thought that about me. You know, people always have an opinion. They always have something to say and they always think, I mean, they have the most surface level opinions about me specifically. And I'm just talking in my experience, um, but I don't really, that's just like noise to me. You know what I mean? Um, I think for me, the way that I, I navigate anything and the way that I've navigated working in environments pretty much all of my adulthood where it is a male dominated field, it's just like, honestly, like honestly God, just remembering my purpose. Like, why am I here? Am I, and like you said, you're here to be of service to people, right? I didn't take this job on because I knew that it was going to, like, fulfill me and my good emotions. It's not. That's the reality. It's it's not, right? You're going to get called a lot of derogatory stuff. You're going to get judged all the time. You're going to get hit on all the time. Um, and people are going to underestimate you. But as a female, I think it's super, super important to... First, if you're going to take up a job in law enforcement, you you need to have either a passion or a purpose behind your reasoning. Um, second, you need to, <laughs> and and this is and this is me just being dead ass. Like, you need to make sure that you're going to be an asset for yourself, for the people that you're working with, and for the people that you're going to be helping. Right. Um, so, the way that I navigate myself within the job to be confident to be able to do it and be confident in myself and my skills and so that my teammates are confident and my abilities to help them is by keeping myself fit um that's also another reality i think that you cannot be a female in law enforcement and like let yourself go or be complacent in your physical abilities to do things because that is a lot of what our job entails it is physical things, um, but most importantly, and this is with males and females, is making sure that your mental health is good, 
you can't try to emotionally regulate anybody without being able to be emotionally regulated yourself or emotionally regulate yourself in real time. So you need to be very cognizant of your triggers. You need to be very cognizant of things that are going to kind of like bother you more than some. I know things for, for me personally, like any cases that have to do with like small children or children being neglected, like I know that sometimes you don't have a, you don't have a choice, right? You, you're the only person on call right, right then and there on the street who's available. And you're like, okay, like I have to deal with this and, and you have to make sure that you emotionally prepare yourself like every single day. It's like you come into work with a combat mentality, but I think you need to be able to be very realistic mentally, but also be very emotionally regulated. And it's a combination of both. It's a combination of being mentally there, emotionally there, but physically there too. No, I agree. I think that can be said about both genders. And I'm kind of glad that you approached it that way because while I do feel that women in law enforcement have a little bit of a different perspective because we're the minority, I think that everyone should be treated the same. And and I, I'll, be, I'll be straight up. Like, when I see a fat person in uniform, I'm like, bro, like, you're supposed to have my back. Like, that's, yeah. to me, I think it's just unsat. And it, that might be, like, the military thing. But the fact that most law enforcement agencies don't uphold any sort of physical standard after the academy like even me like so I'm always going to be like 95% muscle that's just my natural genetics so cardio was always a big thing for me is making sure that I can be a buck 80 and 10% body fat and be able to move but then I, I put in all this work to make sure that not even really just I don't really care how I look but like to be physically ready to then go on a call and I see donut McGee there and I'm just like bro <laughs> Like if shit pops off, I, you, know, you need, I need to make sure that you're okay now because I'm not sure if you are going to be able to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm fortunate enough to work with a lot of the females, female law enforcement officers that I work with, even as like a volunteer with the sheriff's department, they're all pretty on point. Like yeah. I can tell that they care about not just their own health and their own well-being, but about the well-being of the people that they're working with by being physically ready. Yeah. And just like you were saying, like, kind of what's that uh, mad dog quote where it's like be like you know greet everybody you meet but be you know, or be friendly to everybody you meet but be prepared to kill everybody you meet like some sort of like shit like that i'm just like going yeah. to every situation like trying to de-escalate but at yeah. the end of the day just know if shit pops off you have to do it's in the best interest of you and the public around you 100 percent. so and i mean that's the law too right like yeah self-defense and the defense of others you have to yeah. be ready. you have to be mentally and emotionally ready to do that and that's why I love my department. Um, my sergeants are just like, hey, if you feel like you're just not emotion, you're not mentally going to be there, like at work, you're going through stuff, take the day. Like that's yeah. it's a liability. It's a liability. And you have to be very honest with yourself. Like you have to be able to, you know, take accountability of like how you're really feeling. And if you're able to be an asset that day. And if you're not, it doesn't take away from you as an officer it's just like it's actually I think it's it's a sign of just being able to be uh realistic about who you are as a person it's a sign of strength and saying like hey actually I'm not I'm not okay and I don't think that I'm gonna be able to be much help to the citizens or my coworkers. so yeah maybe I should take a day you know I yeah that's, I think that's a lot of uh law enforcement you get into uses of force you get into things that you shouldn't be doing right uh violating people's rights because you're so emotionally volatile that you don't you don't realize what you're doing at that time yeah i think that level of self-awareness is important and especially if you are a public servant i think it's important to um to be aware of that and just know that like you're not going to be the best but to develop the, the skill set to understand that you are having a bad day I think um, I've actually uh, been thinking about going like full-time local law enforcement because I have an amazing sheriff out here yeah. and I'm like, I would love to work for this guy. Like That's awesome. I, I love my boss, but at the same time, I'm just like, I want to work for this guy. Uh, he's <laughs> like, sorry, <laughs> sorry, DHS. Like I, I kind of want to go work for homeboy over here. Cause isn't that going to be like a huge pay cut though? Huge. Like is an understatement, but again, I think aligning my passion and my purpose, kind of like how you how you're saying, 
I think that uh, I feel so detached to the, my purpose and what my mission was, which was to be a service to the country. I think it's you're very far removed. And even though I remind myself of the mission of the agency at the end of the day, sometimes I feel like I would like to do a little bit more. Um, it's more of a direct impact. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. And then, you know, just to be that face, like I remember the first time I saw a female officer, like, you know, I grew up in New York. So the first time I saw an NYPD officer, no, my family is like all law enforcement, all NYPD. And I remember the first time I saw a female, it was actually at my uncle's academy graduation. And I was like, yo, chicks can do this. Like, <laughs> I did yeah. not know that. And she was, uh, she, uh, she was mixed. She was, I think she was black and maybe white or Spanish or probably Puerto Rican. Um, but she was not only a female, but she was another brown female. And I was like, that representation mattered so much to me at such a, like, at such a young age. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, that's what I want to do. Like, she's a badass and I want to be just like her when I grow up. Yeah. So it's my department has very few Hispanic females. Um, I don't think that I know. Of, she's not, she's Spaniard. She's from Spain. Uh, she definitely she's from spain she doesn't look hispanic like um, blonde hair blue eyes like yeah <laughs> like yeah, fair yeah. skinned yeah yes 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 yeah. that's what she looks she's the sweetest person ever such a badass um but when you talk about like the representation of of brown skinned people right like it's oh, man it's hard and i think obviously you know the stigma of like the hatred towards law enforcement um it really really just makes minorities not want to not want to you know work in a capacity like this but yeah, you feel you feel like a traitor it's like you're a traitor to your own people because your own people don't like law enforcement and you're directly doing that like no i i think i think for me it's interesting because my family came here from guyana so my, my mom's side and they're the ones that are all law enforcement. My dad's side is all criminals. <laughs> so go figure, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, the white side is all criminals, and the minorities, the brown people who came over, all they're law enforcement. All law enforcement? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny. No, so yeah, I'm like driving in my patrol car, like, and then uh, my friend like pull up behind me, and I'm like, oh shit, the cops! And then I'm like, what? I'm the cops. <laughs> Literally in a. <laughs> it's me. I was like, I'm not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like Diana. <laughs> <laughs> not illegal anymore calm down yeah that, it's funny because like even now when cops pull up behind me i'm like oh shit like 10 and 2 like i gotta be real careful i'm like <laughs> i'm all right i'm not doing anything illegal mm -hmm. i'll be like a stop sign i'm like yo i gotta stay here one two three i'm like yeah i think it's like a, my friend called it a brown complex at one point and i was like you're probably right there's like the inner brown person in me is like yo don't get pulled over but um, it's but it's not even like a real thing. I've been pulled over a ton of times and I've never had a problem. I remember once I was pulled over going to a flag football game. I had straight up cornrows in my hair. Oh, I'm wearing, I'm wearing like a, like one of those like crop shirts because I was about to throw like my jersey on. And I'm, I'm just looking real ratchet in this car <laughs> and, uh, you know, tattoos. And like, he pulls me over, not a single problem, like mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> yeah. He gave me a speeding ticket, <laughs> but, um, I didn't have to show him a badge. I didn't have to show him. Like, I didn't have to tell him, like, you know who I am or, like, you know who I know. Yeah. Just accepted my infraction and kept it pushing, but um, never had a problem. Now, that's not to say that other people's problems aren't real. There are bad apples in every, in yeah, every you know, field. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, but, we have um, my department, too, and it's really sad because you're just like, dang, dude, I, I trusted you to – I worked alongside you. I, I trusted your judgment. And then, you know, you realize that, like, you think you know somebody and then, like, you really don't. And then you feel bad because it's like, damn, like, you know, then you can, I mean, coming from the other side prior to being in law enforcement, like, I could always empathize with people having really bad experiences because I had bad experiences myself. But um, I think when people who've never had those bad experiences, and then they realize, like, within their own department, there are people who just, you know, they're not honest. And you're like, okay, well, I, I, you can see where, like, the citizens come from. And they're like, okay, you know, it's hard. It, it is hard, in a sense, to trust law enforcement mm -hmm. because there are incidents of just people having bad experiences. And, and they, they should, and we want them to trust us to help them. But then, you know, you have people who just, who fuck up and do the wrong thing and, it just ruins 
Yeah, I think, I mean, we can say that about any field. I think because of because of the fact that we're so public facing with law enforcement and that there is this whole like deadly force aspect that we look at it under a more serious lens, which I understand, but it's like, there are bad apples at Starbucks who are making your coffee right now. <laughs> like they're doing some jacked up shit to your coffee beans. And at the same time, I like, give the same like mentality in, in every single, in every single agency. So I, I yeah. think it's, it's fair to want people to do the right thing, but they're also, it can't just be want, want, want. It's like, how do we get there? Some people just lack emotional intelligence Yeah. and how do we set them up for success? So but anyway, uh, I just wanted to thank you for being here. I got to learn a lot about you, uh, a lot more than I thought I was. I th kind of thought I had an idea of like all the little wickets about you, but that just goes <laughs> to show <laughs> that people are so much deeper than than we realize. And I'm so excited for your like to get a copy of your book, and I'll leave a link to that. And uh, thank you again for being here, taking time away from your kids. To... Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, absolutely. It.